Our castaway this week is the American composer and singer of cynical songs. It's Tom Lehrer. How do you view this Robinson Crusoe business, Tom? Could you stand loneliness? No, I don't think I could. What would you be happiest to have got away from? Oh, I, I hate to say dogs because then everybody will write in. Let me think. <laughs> we'll say no. dogs, then say something <laughs> All else. All right, then I better say something else, yes. And no, just noise, and uh, that, that's the part I think that I would most like is the silence. Right. Now, we know you, of course, for your songs at the piano. Have you a, a wide taste in music? Not that wide. I think most of my interests are in the field of musical theater, one type or another, ranging mm -hmm. from music hall to opera, rather than orchestral music. What's the first one you've chosen? The first one I've chosen is anything by Gilbert and Sullivan. We have, unfortunately, we're forced to narrow it down to something, and so I have just arbitrarily picked the entry of the peers for my Alanthe. But almost any selection would do just as well. All right. Would you like a doyle Cart production? Definitely. Of what sort of date? I think the, uh, the earlier the better. I mean, I realize the sound recording is not as good, but I think the, the feel is... Is better. There's one here dated 1929. How perfect. does that grab That's you? perfect. An excerpt from Gilbert and Sullivan's Iolanthe, recorded, it says, in the small Queen's Hall, London, in the latter part of 1929. You're a New Yorker, Tom, right? Originally, I was born in New York, yes, yeah. right. But which, I've lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts most of my life. Which part of New York? The residential part, Manhattan. How did your music develop? Were you put to the piano, or did you take to it? I took to it. I used to sit there and pick out little tunes, I guess, and then my parents gave me piano lessons and uh, classical, regular, serious music, Chopin and all that stuff, and then uh, and I would dutifully do the minimum practicing that I needed for that, and then in my off hours I would go and pick out popular tunes, and they finally realized that uh, that was where my interest lay, and so they found me a popular music teacher, which was very rare in those days. You were very bright at school, uh, I believe. What did you want to be? What was your ambition? I don't think I ever thought in terms of ambition. Everything always seems to have happened to me, including my present circumstances, that uh, I just enjoyed school and I would have liked to stay in school. I would, I would be a graduate student at Harvard today if they didn't have those silly rules about uh, <laughs> satisfying requirements and so on. That was an ideal life. Right. Off you went to Harvard. Very young, I believe. I was very young, yes. How old? I was 15. Was that permitted uh, at that it's, age, or did you get it, in under the fence? No, at that time, uh, they believed in skipping, what was called skipping. I don't know if you have such a phenomenon here of if you're doing well in a, in a class to the extent that you're disrupting things for the, for the other students, then they would push you forward to another class, which uh, I don't think is a good idea, mm -hmm. but uh, made it easier for them. What were you reading? You mean reading in, 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 in academic Harvard. terms? Yes, uh, mathematics and, to some extent, statistics. You began to entertain your fellow undergraduates at the piano. It was more my fellow graduates when I was a graduate student, because as a graduate student I had much more free time, yes. because we didn't have all those silly requirements. It said that in your sophomore year you wrote a rather bitter pastiche of a Harvard football song, Fight Fiercely <laughs> Harvard. Were you kicking against the sporting establishment? I never did understand sports, I'm afraid. I don't uh, participate, and uh, I prefer to lie down whenever possible. But. I never understood that fervor for, or the, the concept of what's called in America rooting, that is where you have mm -hmm. some team, and just because you happen to go to the same school that the members of the team go to, therefore you prefer that they win the game. I never understood that. <laughs> As an undergraduate, did you take part in Harvard theatricals? No, I didn't. I was, n I was never in theatricals at all. I, in, in high school, I, I did a couple of plays, but that was a long, long time ago. Straight plays? Uh, no, I did the Pirates of Penzance. I was the Pirate King. I suppose everybody has played the Pirate King at one time or another. And I was also in a play called Dead End. But that was about it. I'm not a good actor, and I'm not comfortable acting. So I've never done that. Anyway, after graduating in Harvard, you stayed on to teach mathematics and statistics. That's right. At which point, let us break for your second record. What will that be? Ah, the second record. Well, another one of my idols and early influences uh, after Gilbert and Sullivan was Noel Coward. And again... I could probably select any one of several dozen numbers, but I would certainly take an LP of Mr. Coward's, and for our purposes, let's play Nina. Noel Coward singing his own song, Nina, from his review, Sigh No More. Now, you had this considerable success with your songs at the piano uh, in college. You began to make discs. About 1953, I realized that everybody that w was interested in these songs around Harvard, which was the only place I'd ever performed, 
was pretty sick of them. So I uh, decided that I would make a record. And fortunately, technology had advanced to the stage where there was, the LP was possible. See, yes. again, it's, uh, if, if we only had 78s, this whole thing would never have happened. I wouldn't be here today. Had but, you tried to sell them to the established companies? No. I d it never even dawned on me that there was any commercial value in these things. I, I recorded and paid for myself a few hundred copies yes. to sell around Harvard. But I did take the precaution of putting my address on the back of the jacket so that the mail orders began coming in. <laughs> what was the financial outlay? The initial financial outlay was something like seven hundred dollars for four hundred records. I think everything. Again, it's impossible for somebody to do that today. If somebody says to me, "Well, how did you get started?" I'd like to do the same. Mm -hmm. Just last year, I found the bill for my original recording session, the studio, and it was fifteen dollars well, total. That's a historic that document. That's Hang right. on to I'm that one. Then what happens? There was a steady queue outside your study door to buy a record. Uh, it was a small queue of bizarre people, but what really happened is that uh, people began taking them home. Students took them home for vacation, and uh, summer went past, and I began getting mail orders from various places, and then record shops began saying, we've heard of this, people have come in asking for it, what is this? And then uh, I'd set up the whole distribution. Then I took it around to record companies, and they all said, oh yes, marvelous, and then they listened to it, and then they said, oh no, this isn't the quite <laughs> sort of thing we want on our label. So, uh, that, and I continued handling it myself. But you, you surely weren't equipped to handle nationwide distribution. I mean, you were up all night putting these After things in the <laughs> Licking stamps and, and tying packages. No, it turns out that one can farm this out to the company that pressed the records. You just send them the orders and they'll do it. So eventually, I got the hang of it, and a very small staff was able to, uh, to do it without actually seeing any records. It's mm -hmm. all done by pieces of paper in the mail. Another record. What's your third one? The third one is, again, another... I wouldn't say early influence because it's more recent than that. Most of my I th most of my favorite things that I like to listen to are probably Broadway shows, and this is one of the early great ones, and probably one of the great musicals of all time, Guys and Dolls. I would certainly pick that. And uh, from that, for today's purposes, uh, I have picked Luck Be a Lady. Robert Alder from the New York cast of Guys and Dolls. Luck be a lady. Now, the Tom Lehrer cult grew up very quickly. I remember your discs had a big impact in, in Britain. Originally, they were smuggled over or brought over by various unsavory characters, and um, it took me a long time to get a British company interested in releasing them. I kept sending them over, and they kept sending back, saying, no, this will never sell in England. And finally, uh, I guess they were convinced in some way or other, and they Decca released the first record in 1957 here. Mm -hmm. In fact, it took off rather more quickly, per capita. The sales in the UK are definitely higher than the sales in the United States, given the difference in population. Did capita. they get radio plays? That, I think, is what made some of the difference, is that in Britain they did play them on the radio, and I think even Desert Island Discs occasionally had a, a number from them in those days, but in America they would not uh, consider uh -huh. that. No, there are still a few of your songs at the... BBC are a bit talking So about. I understand. Yes, yes. <laughs> I understand you got into a little bit. Now, how big is the oeuvre? How, how many LPs were issued? Three LPs, 37 songs, and that's it. 37 uh, songs. The first two LPs were released as concert versions and studio versions separately, yes. but uh, the same songs. And it was as a result of the boom in, in the disc that you became, by popular demand, a performer. That's about it, yes. After the success of the first record, I began getting offers to perform in nightclubs and do concerts, and I did that for about three years mm -hmm. until I'd been to everywhere that I, that I wanted to go. You came over here? I came over here in 59, yes, and uh, opened at the Palace Theatre. I remember it well, yes. Sunday nights. And then I did another tour in 60, and then in 1960 I, uh, I gave it up. You had in the meantime been where, to Australia? The whole idea was to quit, and uh, that kept getting postponed because I got an opportunity to go to different places. And Australia and New Zealand were the, were the final places, and then I came to the UK. And I guess my last public concert was in Glasgow. How did you find this affected your status as a, as a mathematician? At that time, I took those, that was about three years that I was doing performing full-time, and I was not in the university and not connected with the university at that time. I realized I, I couldn't do those. But then in 1960, when I, when I quit, I went back and re-enrolled as a graduate student at Harvard. Mm -hmm. They didn't seem to mind. The fact that <laughs> well, that's the, the prodigal big. son returns, they're always glad to see. Very <laughs> big of them. Record mm -hmm. number four. Record number four is from one of probably my two favorite show records, not necessarily my favorite shows, but the discs that I would definitely take. And the first one is a show called She Loves Me, with songs by Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach. And the particular song I have chosen is called Ice Cream. 
Ice Cream from the 1963 New York show, She Loves Me. You wrote and performed a number of songs in the, the United States version of our television show. That was the week that was. Yes, that uh, was in 64 and 65. David Frost came over and started a, an American version, which was considerably watered down from your version. As the producer said at the time, we we're going to be a biting, satirical, hard-hitting, no-holds-barred show. But on the other hand, we don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> and with that as the premise, it was very clear that the program was doomed. And uh, sure enough, it did die after a while. And much to my amazement, these songs which I had written as topical songs, just referring to some event that had happened that week, by the end of the, of the show's run, I had a, almost enough for an LP. So mm. I did it. So this was fuel for the Tom Lehrer boom. That was 65, so for five years I had not performed or appeared anywhere. Mm -hmm. And at that time I decided to try the songs out in front of a nightclub audience because that's the only way you can really try new material. NBC uh, did the television show and they would make a point of cutting the best line out of each song. So another reason that I made the record was to put the lines back in. And uh, the engagement at the Hungry Eye in California, a now defunct nightclub, led to the third LP. That was the year that was. When did you stop writing? Because we have the sad fact that you've stopped writing songs. In fact, you did quite some time ago. Yes, I stopped essentially after that, 65. Since then, the only things I've done were... There's a children's television program in the States called The Electric Company under the auspices of the people who do Sesame Street, and it was designed to teach little children to read. And they called me and asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, of course. See, most people that ask me to write things want me to write things in the style of what I used to do, and I, I don't think my mind works that way anymore. But if somebody comes up with a, a different idea, then uh, it's fine. What happened to your mind, Tom? I mean, why did you stop this sort Nine of... Nine years in California where I can do terrible things to a man's brain. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I think it's, it's... I hate to use the word maturity because that's something I've always tried to slip through unobtrusively and go right from adolescence to senility. But I think one of the things that maturity does gives you a little perspective and you begin seeing both sides and then you can't really attack anybody anymore. Because Why had you moved to California? I was just there half the year. I, I just see. decided that uh, at a certain point, I, I'd been teaching at MIT, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, for nine years, and it just got to be less and less fun. I began taking it more and more seriously. Uh, this was in the political science department I was teaching quantitative courses, and they began to take the science part of their name much more seriously than it deserves. And uh, so I <laughs> decided at a certain point that I was too old not to have fun. And so I decided to go someplace that would be fun. And Santa Cruz, which is a branch of the University of California, was set up for fun. And uh, so I have been there ever since. Well, that sounds a great institution. Now, not writing for 15 years meant that um, things began to sag a bit. The reputation was going downhill, you Well, would the, say. the curious thing is that the records continued to sell, not the way they did uh, when, the, when they first came out, of course, but once they had leveled off to a plateau, they've remained just about constant for the past, let's say, 12 years. Mm -hmm. And then came a revival. Then uh, a certain revival, I think what happened is partly the younger generation grew up, because I've heard many reports of young people, say, uh, late teenagers, uh, who were uh, rummaging through their parents' record collections come across this peculiar... 10-inch disc, and they can't imagine what it could be, and they put it on, and then they they uh, find it hard to believe that this was done so long ago. And so I, I think the market now is uh, largely younger people, which I'm delighted. I mean, certainly when I did those records, I had not the faintest idea that they would sell at all at the time, let alone that 27 years later, people would still be buying them. Your next record, what now? The next record is from the other show, the other show uh, LP that I think I would most like to have with me, and that is Candide, the Leonard Bernstein operetta. The particular song that I have chosen for this program is called Bon Voyage. It's sung by uh, William Olvis. I think that's an amazing score. That whole, that whole record is fantastic. Oh, it is. It's, it's a lovely score, and mm -hmm. giving credit where credit is due, it's by Leonard Bernstein. Right, with words by Richard Wilbur. I always want to credit the, uh, the librettist, because the, the, uh, the lyricist, that is, they never get enough credit. So... You're teaching, what, six months in the year in California? I teach six months, yes, at the University of California at Santa Cruz. I teach a course in applications of mathematics to social science. Don't what ask. <laughs> there are very few of them. It's, it's mainly a device to proselytize for mathematics, in which I have a great interest, uh, to show people that mathematics 
uh, contrary to a, a very popular belief, is not just a collection of methods for solving problems, but is a way of looking at things and, and uh, a way of looking at the world. And so I can use as my text anything from the newspapers or magazines, which falls under the heading of social science very roughly, which means essentially everything. And you're also taking another course. The other course is a course in the American musical. At last, something that has been my hobby and interest for so long is now uh, paying off. Uh, Do you mean I'm to say that the, the, your students can major in, in this? No, they can't major in it. This is just one course. Uh, I, see. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think it should even be given for credit myself, but as long as the university is willing to grant credit for it, I'm delighted to. What uh, is the uh, official title of the course? The official title is The American Musical. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we, we study the genre. We do reading performances of musicals, one every two weeks. Right from the beginning, what was the first New York musical, The Black oh, something? The Black Crook, but no, I, the history is not, doesn't concern me so much as the, uh, as the literature. I mean, it's, I study it as one studies any kind of dead art form historically, but I feel that the, essentially the golden age is over, and so I'm mainly covering the years from Pal Joey to Fiddler on the Roof, roughly, mm -hmm. 42 to 65, something like that. Well, where do we go now? Where do we go now? Well, let's see, a change of pace, as they say in the showbiz, uh, a pop record. There are very few of the current pop singers or performers that I admire because I, usually I don't, just don't understand the words and being a, a word man, there are many people, Elton John, the Bee Gees and so on, for example, that I like the music of, and of course the Beatles, that goes without saying. But very few of the current singer-songwriters can I understand. And one of the few that I do and sympathize with is Randy Newman and he's written many, many marvelous songs, and I think he shares a certain cynical attitude that I have. And uh, the song that I've chosen is from the LP that I would choose, and it's the title song, Sail Away. He tries to do some of the sort of thing that I like to do, which is to take some sardonic or biting subject and, uh, or attitude and set it to very pleasant music, uh, thus disguising the, the uh, thorns in there. <laughs> yes, indeed. And these cynical lyrics of yours are still relevant today. I mean, as a result of the Lehrer revival, there is now a Lehrer show playing in London, Tom Foolery. I thought you'd never mention it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tom Foolery is the name of it, and a man named Cameron McIntosh, a producer of exquisite taste, decided that this might be a good thing to take these old songs and put them together into a review. And he has done so, and uh, Gillian Lynn, the director, has done marvelous things. Uh, interpreting the songs, and there they are, a marvelous cast of four people. I'm using words like marvelous and wonderful too much, but uh, I really am overcome with the... How the much have you had to change the lyrics to, to update them? We tried very hard not to update them in the sense of trying to pretend that they are of the 80s. They're not, definitely. The only changes that had to be made were certain references which either would be incomprehensible to British audiences or references which were so rooted in their time that uh, everybody's forgotten what they were. So minor little changes of that nature. Also, I have written a few little verses here and there. Basically, the, the, the original 37 songs. Uh, not all of them. There are, about, there are 27 songs in the show, and uh, 25 are from the three records. There's yeah. uh, one from the Electric Company songs, too. Uh -huh. So you're saving the other 10 for the second edition when that comes no, out? <laughs> I don't think. No, I think we, we really weeded out the ones that would be totally incomprehensible uh, to Tom, a British audience. Were you tempted to take part yourself? I mean, the fact that you, you did your five years shows with a certain amount of the ham in you. I mean, can you really sit back and watch these people singing your songs and you're not up on the stage I, doing it too? I can't tell you what a relief it is to be in the audience. I've sat through many rehearsals and many performances of this show before it opened and, and an opening night. I did take a bow opening night. I did get on the stage to that extent. Mm -hmm. But at no point watching these people do the songs did I ever think... Gee, I wish I was up there doing that. Let's have another record. Well, another one of my great idols, current, current idols, is Stephen Sondheim, the most brilliant lyricist that ever lived, I believe. And uh, so, again, it's very hard to choose something, and I have chosen a particular song. I guess I would pick the LP side by side by Sondheim, but for our purposes, I'm picking a song from uh, A Little Night Music, which is probably the most popular song that Stephen has written with words and music by him is uh, called Send in the Clowns. For six months of the year, Tom, you're a beach boy. Down well, there not in California. quite, because now we all know about skin cancer. But I, uh, I do stay in California. And the weather isn't that marvelous in Santa Cruz. It's far enough north. It's not quite uh, surfing country. But well, what this is leading up to is how would you make out on the beach of a desert island? Could you look out ah, for yourself? I see. No, not at all. I, I don't know how I would manage. I would probably be able to manage if the fruit 
fell from the trees without my having to climb them, and uh, if I could make, get some water somewhere, but uh, it would be pretty boring. Could you build any kind of shelter? Are you good with your hands? No, totally impossible. But I assume if one is stranded on a desert island forever, uh, one learns pretty rapidly with, through experimentation. Can you cook? I don't cook very much. I thaw, and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. we probably couldn't manage that on a desert island. So I could probably manage. I wouldn't know about how to light a fire, though. It's been years since I tried that, so I would hope that there would be some matches there, but I suppose if one could figure it out how to do well, that. Well, of course, your watch glass, your spectacles. Ah, yes, I so. forgot if I had the Boy Scout handbook. Or something. Would you try to escape? Do you know anything about small craft, about N navigation? No, I know. A mathematician who should know about navigation. No, I, the mathematicians don't. You're thinking of engineers, I believe. <laughs> uh, mathematicians <laughs> don't know anything about anything. You see, we don't even deal with things like one, two, and three. We deal with X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. and that's quite a different concept. So I could probably imagine a theoretical... A procedure for escaping from a desert island, but as far as putting into practice, I'm afraid I'd be hopeless. All right, well, we'll try and get you <laughs> fetched before too long. That's right. And we've come now to your last record, number eight. Last record was intended to give a little class to the proceedings here. It's uh, from my favorite opera. I, mean, I do like operas too, as an example of musical theater. And uh, I would choose the Rosen Cavalier. And uh, the selection in particular that we have here is the uh, duet at the very end. Christa Ludwig and Teresa Stitch Randall in that closing passage from Der Rosenkavalier, Herbert von Karajan was conducting the Philharmonia Orchestra. If you could take only one disc out of the eight you chosen, which would it be? No, you've got me. I, I think it, I would not have too much trouble narrowing it down to Candide or the Rosenkavalier, and I think if you really press me, I would pick the Rosenkavalier not because I necessarily prefer it, but because I'm less familiar with it and there would be more there to entertain me for a longer period of time. You're allowed to take one luxury to the island, any one object of no practical use which would give you pleasure. Well, I would, I would certainly pick uh, a piano of some sort, whatever sort of piano one could be managed on a desert island. I mean, yes. I'm sure it would go out of tune in, in an instant, but on the other hand, uh, that's the way I sing. All right, you can, you can take a set of tuning instruments as and well. That's right. And right. it has Good. to be an upright piano, you understand? I understand, that. so you can't sleep under it. That's yes. right. All right. And one book, apart from the Bible and Shakespeare, and we don't encourage multi-volume encyclopedias. <laughs> No, I, th I think there would be no hesitation there. I would take the uh, Oxford uh, English Dictionary, either the full version or some condensation thereof, some unabridged dictionary anyway. Right. That would take, give me many hours of pleasure. And thank you, Tom Lehrer, for letting us hear your Desert Island disc. Thank you very much, Roy. I enjoyed it a lot. Goodbye.